The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. In terms of the housing sector, the policy slogan, Common Prosperity, actually emphasizes housing is for living in, not for speculation. It's interesting if you go back to the history, Deng Xiaoping suggested that housing is not only for living in, it is an asset, a capital gain opportunity. So now to say housing is for living in, not speculation, is to change this mentality. In China, almost 90% of the houses are privately owned, but a large proportion of the houses were owned by a relatively smaller percentage of the population. So the rental market is actually quite active. But in China, people look up to ownership and the dream in their life is trying to own the house. So uh, the opportunity to own the house at the moment is actually not equal, not only in terms of price, but also in terms of access. In this episode, how China finds a home for 1.4 billion people. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. China's extraordinary economic rise over the last 40 plus years has been accompanied by possibly the greatest movement of people in history, as hundreds of millions relocated from the countryside to coastal cities in search of work and better lives. Putting a roof over the heads of this vast influx of humanity has become a challenge for authorities at all levels of government. Policymakers in Beijing view urbanisation as key to reducing poverty among China's still sizeable rural population. And as a result, there's been a proliferation of urban growth in rural heartlands. And since China jettisoned its centrally planned economic policies in the late 70s, the private sector has joined the public sector in a lively and at times distorted real estate landscape. Recent moves by Xi Jinping to reduce wealth inequality, the recent near-death experience of the massive private property developer Evergrande and unfavourable demographic shifts are leaving many worried about what lies ahead for housing in China. So how is China meeting the challenges of providing 1.4 billion people with somewhere to live and preferably call home? How do migrant workers fare in the quest for accommodation in the nation's metropolises? And how effective is urbanisation in reducing rural poverty? Joining me over Zoom to inspect housing in the world's most populous nation are experts in China social policy and governance, Professor Bingqin Li from the University of New South Wales and Dr Lei Yu from Asia Institute. A very warm welcome, Bingqin, and to you too, Lei. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, there is unquestionably a lot of people in China who need a place to call home. Can you lay draw us a broad picture of housing in China? What does it look like? I think to understand the whole housing picture in China, we need to understand to date, China is still a very divided society, urban and rural. So when we're talking about rural, most of the people own their home and they built their house by themselves. Well, in urban, most of people live in high rises, apartments, and size wise, a bit smaller. But the China urban home ownership rate, according to number of the surveys and national data, and are very high. 2010 census data shows 70% home owner occupy rate in urban China. Well, 2020, the Central Bank of China survey data shows the home ownership rate is as high as 96%. However, to understand these data as many people may be a homeowner doesn't mean they live in their home where they work. China today, in urban particularly, facing a serious jobs and housing mismatch or we'll call imbalance issues. Um, that is when people left home and work in cities, particularly coastline, as you mentioned, with more jobs, they not able to afford expensive houses in the coastline cities, but they do save and to purchase a home at their original hometown. So in bigger cities, 
quite a high percentage, could be like Shanghai, like Guangzhou, particularly Shenzhen, the rental rate. Are very high. Shenzhen is only 23% people own their home. Well, in Shanghai and Guangzhou, the rental rate probably is roughly around 40% or even more. That's probably is a big picture of housing in terms of ownership and rental tenure structure in China. But today, urban housing affordability is a particularly an issue and a challenge, and that's、uh, mainly talking about migrants, newly migrant from their less developed or rural areas to coastal cities, and also the younger generations. And as family size in China is becoming smaller, younger people would like to have their own home rather than live together with the parents. And so the generation, the family. Pattern also changes, and through the rapid economic change and、uh, marketization in the past thirty,、uh, forty years, those home ownership issues, lay, I guess, they're common globally, particularly for young people. But from what you were just saying about the number of people who own, I assume that that means that in some of these cities, a number of people own more than one residence. That's correct. The average whole nationwide data which shows a household number and、uh, house number is one point one. So that means averagely each household own more than one house. In coastal cities, first tier, what we call Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, like that, this kind of a rate is under one. And in northern, like Dongbei area, the rate is very high. It's around over one point one, one point two. And on the other hand, housing inequality is a significant issue, exactly as you mentioned. So the data also shows the lowest income, twenty percent of population, urban population, owns only six percent of the space of all housing, while the top twenty percent income household owns forty percent of all total housing space. So this inequality rate is extremely high. And Bingqin, if I can bring you in here,、uh, we, we'll obviously we'll have a look further at that split in the housing market in a minute. But how much social or public housing,、uh, government subsidised housing, is there in China? The government subsidies in China has several forms. One is subsidised ownership. So basically, when you buy houses and you get some subsidies through the interest rate, and also another one type is subsidized rental. That can be public rental, which is you have to pay sixty percent of the rent, market rent. And another type is this low rental or cheap rental, which is a fixed amount. Usually, these are older houses. In terms of the proportion, is actually quite low. The subsidized rental is below five percent of the total. Bingqin, when we look at the high number of people who own a home, but the fact that when you're looking at the lowest income groups, they own a very small proportion of the houses. How much of that is to do with China's household registration system or HUKO, which began in the 50s but still exists today? Because even though that system has had a number of changes made to it, many migrant workers still can't access services, can they? And even if they could afford to buy a house in some of these tier One or tier two towns or cities they move to, they wouldn't be allowed to buy a house. In some、uh, cities, of course, depending on、uh, which、uh, city you are talking about, cities like Shanghai and Beijing is actually quite difficult for outsiders to have access. In the past, they were not allowed to buy, and also every time when the government try to、uh, control the price a bit, it's always the migrants that become、uh, more difficult for them to buy. And also, of course, these are also often related to the fact that the people who actually travel around the country to speculate in the houses were often migrants, but they are not rural to urban migrants. They are actually urban people trying to organize into groups to、uh, speculate houses. But as a result, rural to urban migrant workers were suffered because of these controls over the speculation. But just back on that household registration system, Lei, can you give us a little bit of an insight at what that system means for people in twenty twenty two? Hukou reform and started, I think, the decade ago, and it's gradually relaxing. 
which means people are allowed to move out from where their original town they was born to live in new cities and then apply for hukou and becoming the local hukou residents. This only limited to smaller, we call third, fourth tier cities. More recently, policies have pushed for the second tier cities. The top level first tier cities, the most populated coastline cities, and still very stringent in terms of accepting new hukou people or hukou transfer. So with or without local hukou, what does that mean from housing perspective? It means you just cannot access many of the government subsidized housing. For quite a long time, from market reform or China totally entered into the market system 1998, the government subsidized housing or have eligibility criteria require most of the city set their own rules in detail, but most of those all have local hukou requirement, particularly for the low-income rental. Although city governments introduce various new programs and so-called talent programs, and they try to bring in the younger talents and better educated or overseas educated, and they provide them subsidized home ownership and then that to help keep them in the town and contribute to the economy. But if we're talking about lower income, those one who really in need, for example, the rural migrant workers, and they are working in informal sector or service sector, and they are making relatively much lower wage, they are the population that has to rely on themselves. According to the data, the government start releasing the migrant workers statistics data from 2009 I just had a look and then like as a comparison from 2009 and 2018. So in 2009, most migrants, those low income, uh, low skill workers, over 56%, they live in employer provided housing. You can understand that quite many of them working for manufacturing or so constructions and all of these, uh, or even restaurants. And uh, the employers will provide dormitories, which can be very poor quality, very small space, and can be not necessarily as nice and, and not necessarily have private bathroom, kitchen. But the data changes. And in 2018, this dropped to only 13%. So from 52% to 13%, well, the majority are now private rent in 2020. So many of them cannot afford because the rental sector in China hasn't been a focus of policy and it's very behind and lagging and underdeveloped. More recently, 2015, 2016, government has started pushing for the rental sector development, but the private sector more prefer for high end of rental sector. They want to rent to people who can afford higher rate. So 2021, government introduced a new policy called affordable rental. And that one is try to sort of fill the gap of that market supply. But still, relatively, rental sector in China is very small. And many are informal. You might have heard of urban village, which are gradually from former village become urban area. And they are former residential properties and former farmers. And they convert them into a cheap rental. Like in Guangzhou, I visited many of the Chenzhongtun urban village. There are many of low-income migrant workers living in those informal rental sector. And Lei, when we look at the the impact of the household registration system, not just on housing, but I guess even more broadly, it really entrenches the wealth divide, doesn't it? And how committed do you think authorities are to really reforming that system, or are they are they not? Does it suit tier one, tier two cities to be able to have more control over who lives in their homes? Hukou reform is a debate. I think it's been a long time, and there are arguments about we should totally phase this system out. And but there are still arguments about need a certain type of a control because the overpopulated city are the reason for a lot of an urban issues and problems like traffic jams and pollutions and energy issues and all of this. And so. The city governments, probably particularly coastline cities, I think, can also see need for the hukou system for them to have this control. But I think the underlying issue, which hasn't been resolved, and it is still the fiscal issue, and is about how city government to have the enough resources to look after their growing population 
what capacity city government has and how central and local fiscal divide can contribute and to improve the capacity of city governments and able to provide public services in an equal manner. It's a capacity issue. So a lot of times we will say like city governments only care about economic growth and they only want to help those educated and skilled and that contribute to the economic growth. And they need a tax income. They need a revenue incomes in order to pay for all the public services and including housing, including public housing. And of course, one way they get revenue is from selling land, but we'll get to that in a minute. Bing Chin, let me ask you just a little to take us, I suppose, through the the broad changes in government attitudes and policies towards housing. I said at the outset that urbanisation is seen as a way of creating wealth. And if you look at the urban population, it's more than doubled in the last 30 years. Some of that is because of reassigning land use, but also because millions have moved to the cities. How, how have government attitudes and policies changed? I think you raised a very important question just now. There is also this dynamic perspective of the urban housing, which means that if you go to Chinese cities, you can see that older houses were uh, particularly in the more sort of central areas were uh, kept getting demolished and the cities are expanding to the peri-urban area. This means that the housing supply is constantly changed. Actually, you know, there are all these speculations of how many square meters houses and the surveys and all these. To be honest, people really do not know exactly uh, what amount of houses are there because a lot of houses built in 1990s were already demolished. At the same time, in the peri-urban area, even though there were new housing constructions, but often at the cost of the supply of informal houses. As a result, this kind of dynamic change makes it very difficult for people to really understand where people are living and also exactly what is available. What we can see now is mostly the calculation of the average, but the locational mismatch and the dynamic of change quite often is hard to take into account very accurately. Well, Bingqin, you were just talking there about, I guess, some of the difficulties in actually getting a handle on it, you know, exactly what the real estate or the property sector looks like in China. If we look specifically at private housing, is private housing the dominant player in this market, isn't it, Bingqin? Yes. As Lei just mentioned, almost 90% of the houses are privately owned which means that the houses are privately owned, but of course the people who live in the houses are not necessarily the owner. A large proportion of the houses were actually uh, owned by a relatively smaller percentage of the population. So as a result, the rental market is actually quite active. But at the same time, in China, people look up to ownership and the dream in their life is uh, trying to own a house. So uh, the opportunity to own the house at the moment is actually not equal, not only in terms of price, but also in terms of access. How, how much harder has it become, Bing Chin? I can just give you a kind of an example. In Beijing, near the university area, you have a three-bedroom apartment. It can be as expensive as uh, 10 million. 10 million yuan? Yeah. Is there ready access to funding, to mortgages, to home loans? There are mortgages to borrow, but the reality is this also makes it uh, challenging for a large proportion of the migrant population who may not have a steady income or kind of working on more sort of a casual type of jobs. Also, uh, there is this underlying challenge that these days more and more people are not working in the conventional salary earning type of jobs. Of course, this issue hasn't been raised so much among non-migrant populations, but for the migrant population, it's always a challenge. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. Just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, 
again, you can find it at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by experts in China's social policy and governance, Professor Bing Chin Lee from the University of New South Wales and Dr. Lei Yu from Asia Institute. So, Lei, if we look at uh, the private property sector from the development point of view, I think many of us have seen, in fact, most of us would have seen the pictures of the empty apartment buildings in China, even some of them torn down after developers have defaulted. Others have got people living in them, even though they're unfinished shells, because they've got no choice when developers go bust. And the numbers are extraordinary. China's reported to have 65 million empty homes. What's gone wrong? Well, a couple of reasons, I think. I also have another data, which is, I think, a recent research, 2018, from Southeast University. They found 130 million units are unoccupied in China, which just takes about 20% of the total housing sector. But these are all owned. So privately owned home. And they just left empty and because there were no property tax and the keep a house empty, it costs you very little. So a lot of middle class and wealthy populations and seeing housing as a good asset and a capital gain and guaranteed a place to put their money. So um, 2015 is the year, I think the national statistics data was showing like the overall national average, it's enough housing for every single household, but regional disparity, as we just so far discussed, and is significant. We do have kind of ghost cities like in Mongolia and uh, those areas. Interestingly, recently I read that some of the ghost cities are all gradually, there are residents moving in, gradually picking up and take like I think more than a decade and for some places and even local government, uh, the famous case in the Orders, they said now the housing occupied rate is 90% already. I think it is nature of how China urbanized contributes to this whole story. As the city government, back to the fiscal questions, the city government's relying on the land lease income or land selling income, which kind of motivate the city governments to convert peri-urban rural land into the urban areas. And that speed is very fast because they're motivated and soft budget management and all of that can contributes into a lot of the city just built house too soon, too quickly, and too many and more than what we need. But over time, as the urbanization rate taking up more and more people from rural areas and coming to the urban areas and they need place to live. Even recently, I think that we are still saying there are potential demands for the housing sector. The housing sector still has future. There are still 200 million more people will come into urban and they need a place to live. It's a question is just like in short period, we see on Occupy rate and we see ghost cities. And But over time, so far, we've seen gradually people moving in, so become occupied. Bing Chin, Lei just made the point about supply running ahead of demand. For example, local governments, of course, selling a lot of land, maybe creating more housing than they, they needed to create at the time. But of course, when they sell the land, they are very dependent on private developers to develop it into housing. And when we look at the very high profile examples like Evergrande, which is you know this massive property developer that has been threatening to go under for a number of years now, what's happened there? What's driven? Driven that uh, sort of boom, virtual, you know, risk of bust cycle in private development. I think it is important to look at the role of the government here. One of the important sources of revenue is land. So when the government is leasing land to these property developers, and the property developers are anticipating the house price will increase. So as a result, they build houses, also return the money to the government which is at a very high rate, and sometimes it can be as high as 60% for the land and the surcharges. And also build on this, and the property developers want to sell the houses to the private sector. And then when they try to sell 
the houses, the way they do it is they push for their employees to give them targets to sell aggressively. As a result, in this process, there's a lot of high publicity and in order to sell the house. But then at some point when it's getting more and more expensive, and also, for example, with the Evergrande, they even ask their own employees to sell so aggressively that some employees decided to take on these uh, mortgages themselves and then make it difficult for themselves to sustain. So in the case of Evergrande, it went bust first from their own staff members. So this whole layer upon layer add up to the land value, house value, mortgage, and by the time it's reached the homeowners, it becomes less and less sustainable. Evergrande, of course, it's being restructured so far. It actually it hasn't collapsed, even though we've been warned for years about the massive threat it would pose to global markets if it did collapse. And I guess that's one issue. But Bing Chin, in terms of that, you know, that sort of situation that Evergrande is, how indicative is it of the state of other players in the property market? And isn't one of the issues just that they've expanded so fast, they've taken on so much debt, their risk profiles have been so high? Before this whole situation, particularly before the COVID-19, basically it has reached a state that people just think that the house price will continue to grow because population will continue to grow. And in the largest cities, there were all these kind of warning and the government was also trying to control the house price to some extent. But people still think that in smaller cities, it would go well. So what you could see in the past uh, 10 years and uh, some of these largest companies, uh, including Evergrande and uh, Big Yuan, they have already moved inland to smaller areas. And also they, apart from the housing land, they also try to get into other types of land. So there's all this anticipation that the land supply is limited and the government would bail out because the government would count on land price. So there is this kind of a vicious cycle that make it easier for the companies to uh, get into the sector and then hope that they can get more back in the future. If not, the government would bail them out. Lay, what do you think about Evergrande and how indicative it is of the broader industry and indeed whether or not Evergrande will successfully be restructured? Do you think it is a little too early to call a soft landing on this whole crisis? In my view, I think soft landing or keep this whole crisis and on the controllable extent is the goal of central government, is the goal of the central bank. So Evergrande issues also, I think it's to some extent related with the the all restructuring of China's economic model. China has to, and the real estate sector is uh, definitely oversized from economic perspective. So correction is inevitable. But this whole housing sector is interesting is because China has such a high home ownership. The central bank said it's 96% of their survey data. And 70% of households, their wealth are all hold in their property, whether they own one or two. And then 30% of the bank loan are the individual residential house mortgage loan, which means government has a very fine line because government cannot afford housing price to decline. To some extent, it cannot accelerate it downhill because that will hurt people, will hurt the whole financial sector because even though 96% people own their home, 56% of them share that ownership with bank. That's on the one hand of the government, very fine line, what they can do. They wanted to stable housing price increase and to just stable it, even not increase, but not really dramatically decline. On the other hand, since the global financial crisis and since the fiscal stimulus policy 2008, the whole soft budget for the government and the soft loan for the bank and the cheap debt, it's all pushed up and contributes into all the crisis. And Evergrande just took advantage of all opportunities offered to them, testing government and see how far they can push. So now the question, I think what government cares most, what we have to wait and see is whether this become a contention. I mean, will this spill over to other big enterprises, real estate enterprises, or it will contain just an individual case for Evergrande? 
I think we still wait and see. So far, it seems the problem is a three red line policy. Since 2020, the government put what they call a macroeconomic prudent policy and a monetary tightening policy that just not allowed real estate to continue borrowing to an unhealthy over leveraging extent. Uh, Evergrande definitely caught by that whole policy change. They just couldn't borrow anymore to pay their bond payment. So yeah, wait and see, I will say. But all the effort is goes into soft lending as much as possible. Very much trying to reduce those extraordinary debt levels. And I'll come back to that fine line, as you put it, Lei, in a minute. But Bing Ching, can I just ask you about the public sector housing? We, we briefly touched on social or subsidised housing at the outset, but who qualifies for public housing? How easy is it to get it if you need it? What I mean by public housing, there are two types. One is this very cheap type of housing. That is usually for the people who had very low income. You have to prove that you have a very low income. And also uh, you apply. And uh, based on the assessment, they will look at exactly what type of income you have and even try to look at what kind of furnitures you have at home to decide your low income. And then if you are considered truly low income, have no job, you would have access to this type of uh, cheap rental housing. That is usually for urban residents only. So if you were a migrant worker who'd gone to Guangzhou, for example, you would not be able to get subsidized housing? Uh, not this type of cheap rental housing, but you can get into social housing, uh, 60% of the market rate I mentioned earlier. In the past, initially, it was only available to university graduate, but then later, the demand was actually not that high. So it's also opened up to rural to urban migrants in many cities, including uh, cities like Shenzhen. But even so, the demand for this type of houses are not very high because comparing to the subsidized ownership is not that worthwhile. You can make more money, if you, I guess, if you can put in a, a tenant who can pay more. The, the other big change that, of course, is coming in China is demographics and the fact that the growth in the population is slowing and the population is ageing. Bing Chin, how do you think that's going to affect uh, housing policy and the housing industry? Yeah, I think in the long run, it's actually a very important trend that can potentially uh, change the direction of the home ownership scenario. Because if you think about a lot of the one child these days who are already adults and their parents have their own apartments. So in the future, for one adult children, there might be uh, three apartments. And of course, what people anticipate is that uh, there is a potential that these people who have extra apartment would rent out to make the urban housing rental market more affordable to the migrant population, or the house price would just drop down and make it more affordable to migrant population. But so far, what you can see is actually the rental market is getting more popular. A lot of these houses were actually houses from the parents' generation. Lei, how do you see the, the impact of the demographic trends? Well, it might end up one day the younger generation and inherit many houses from their generations up. But on the other hand, aging itself in particularly big city like Beijing and Shanghai is very old and average. And we are start seeing, I mean, People are looking into the nursing home as option because we have less children and people live longer and the looking after caring is a very heavy burden and sometimes it's very difficult to balance and for the generation in middle, you have to work and both work and full-time job. You have children, you have to look after them, and you have elder parents and sometimes even grandparents. And so one person looking after that many, it's almost not possible. And therefore, the nursing home, that sector and the senior care sector is growing. These are all cost. And uh, even though people own home, like the elder generation, many of them, um, they own the home because of the reform, the transition as they purchase purchase their former rental property from their enterprises or government and become their own at cheap price. So although they own their home, maybe that home worth a lot because it's good location and in city center, but they might cash poor. So 
if you wanted to move to a nicely set up nursing home, you need to pay for that. You sell your property and then you need that fund to pay for the care when you age. In. On the other hand, like not all young people able to afford in big cities, as we just mentioned, the housing are more and more expensive. It's harder and harder for younger people to afford the home. Like my generation, I've even had friends and former colleagues. And uh, when you get married, you have to have, particularly for boy, you have to have a privately owned home. Otherwise, you're not qualified for the marriage market. Many of them, they don't have that kind of money. And so it goes into the pocket of the parents and that is parents will sell their house or they give their house to their children to get married. They themselves then go to rent. So there are various cases. And I think particularly in big cities, it's very complex. Lay, do you think that we are going to see, though, in coming years, a sort of restructuring of the housing market, particularly if you get a big growth in aged care homes, you know, caring for your older parents in the family home is not the most common thing. If the views around that do change, the entire property or housing market could change, couldn't it? possible it's still you only see some indication in big cities but nursing home relatively is still not popular preference and people traditionally still would like their children look after them and the family look after them and uh, wanted to pass their property as an asset the most valuable asset to the children but inevitable it's just a reality adjustment and i think it's too early to tell because of the policies are also suggest the home support so whether that sector can carry catch up and so people still living their own home but have people to look after them but I think in the big city Beijing and Shanghai even my hometown Suzhou nearby in Jiangsu province nursing home is growing and that kind of lifestyle when you're old retired and you still independent relatively independent but you would like to move into the nursing home and so you have all same age your friends all there it's kind of a lifestyle change i see that kind of change i wouldn't say it's nationwide but i can see that kind of change in some of more kind of developed fast aging cities and areas we're coming to the end of our conversation but bing chin we talked earlier about the different iterations of government policy towards housing and last year of course xi jinping adopted this concept of common prosperity how do you think that's going to impact on housing and do you think it's going to drive the government to walk that fine line which lay talked about even more carefully, given that so much wealth is tied up in property and it's so important to people's sense of well-being. I think this common prosperity basically reflected in housing. The idea is that whoever lives in a city, you should have a place to live or you should have a place called home, whether it is rental or it is uh, ownership. Also, echoing to what Lei just mentioned, related to older population, I can give you an example. There can be some type of potential for local innovations. For example, in Shanghai, the central area is very highly concentrated with the older people. Before COVID, there were actually uh, experiments trying to convince the older people to move to peri-urban area to develop old age friendly communities that provide services of old age care. And at the same time, because their house is in the central location is uh, more expensive, this area can be redeveloped and leased out to the workers. And at the same time, some of the cash flow will go to the older people who move to the peri-urban area to subsidize their old age care. So there are some of these efforts trying to experiment with changing the locked in assets to cash flow and also benefit different generations of uh, the population and also subsidize old age care. Of course, with the COVID, a lot of things were put on hold at the moment, but still it's worthwhile to keep an eye on these type of uh, potential innovative solution. And also we need to pay attention that often with these type of innovation, things can go uh, predatory at some point. So it's important to look at both the benefit and the potential threat to the rights of ownership of the population. 
Lay, how do you see the concept of common prosperity and the impact that will have on how the government views that very fine line that it's walking when it comes to housing and property? In my view, the common prosperity is a long-term goal, and it's always a goal of government because that's the responsibility of a communist party believe themselves and to ensure everyone have a home. But how to achieve common prosperity, and that involves with redistribution. In terms of the housing sector, what I see is the policy slogan actually emphasize is housing is for living in, not for speculation. It's interesting if you go back to the history and the 1978, 1979, when Deng Xiaoping suggested that housing is a sector, is driving of the economy. At that time, it is to educate people or change the concept to say housing is not only for living in, it is an asset and it is a capital gain opportunity. So now to say housing is for living in, not speculation, is to change this mentality is you don't have to own a home. And as long as you have a secure place to live as a tenant, that's also a good choice. There were data was showing like home ownership too high is not necessarily a good thing for economy um, because that is harmful to mobility. So you want to encourage people move and then they test and try in city they can rent as long as the rental sector is available, affordable. And then you might think it's not suitable and then you move to the other city. Or like I mentioned, many people purchase home in other cities, which they can afford. Because housing prices, the gap is a significant, the coastline and central areas. So common prosperity is already a very, I would say, abstract concept. And how to achieve it, there are many aspects. And then the housing sector is not just alone. There are so many industries all connected to that. And there are so many issues and all linked to problems and challenges and government facing today. Indeed, Lei. And I mean, if you look at that, if the desire of the government is to try and get people to not think that they have to own their own home, you only have to look at any other part of the world <laughs> where governments face exactly the same challenge with so much wealth tied up in property in so many countries. An enormous thank you to both of you for your insights on Ear to Asia today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Bing Chen, and thank you, Lei. Thank you very much, Ali and Lei. Thank you. Our guests have been Professor Bing Chin Lee from the University of New South Wales and Dr Lei Yu from Asia Institute. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 13th of May 2022. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of ProFactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2022, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.